Yeah. So my name is Will. I'm a systems engineer here at SpringPath, and I'm just going to walk you through our solution. I know we have, we're a little limited on time, so I'll just kind of go through the highlights and maybe not the whole thing. Happy to schedule a full demo with you guys anytime. So let me walk through what it actually looks like to deploy the solution. There's uh, two models to do it. Uh, we'd, we have a distribution contract with TechData, so if you're buying a new server, uh, you have the option to talk to your reseller and have the whole bundle solution sent to you. And so our software is pre, pre-installed, you boot up your server, ESX, etc., is preloaded. The other option is if you already have an existing server where you want to deploy our solution. Uh, we basically have an OVA you can deploy that will walk you through the steps of installing the software. And basically that will deploy the OVF, etc., automatically configure ESX, configure VM Direct Path, etc. And basically, at the end of that, you get to this point, where you can now point a web browser to an IP address of one of the controller VMs. And this brings up what we call our Bootstrap UI. I'm just going to click Continue. Okay. You agree to so pay us. So I need us. a controller VM on each host? Yes, there's okay. one on each host that's hosting the storage servers. It's kind of what Malik was talking about. Those compute nodes don't necessarily have to have our controller VM right. running. Right, on. only if it's involved in the storage, exactly. not if it's so I, a the, client to the storage, if it's a server the, of the, the storage. The part I don't remember. Hmm. Hmm is how you guys are handling the cluster front end. Because I've got six, phys- six servers providing storage. Do they all respond? But NFS and multipathing are not things that go together well. Yeah, so so how do you load balance the ingest? That's where that uh, uh, IRE director code comes in. It's a simple POSIX code. Which goes which types into so the where but where does it run on, on, run on ESXi? In the, in, the, in the case of computer only node, it'll run on a user user land in the uh, user one. Yeah, the, but there's no user land in ESXi. There's kernel and there's VM. There is, there is a user land but that, like it a host is, it, install, it installs as a VIM. Correct. Yes, exactly. Like a VAA, you no know, VAA. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so that's kind of like grid store. So that so data gets intercepted and then directed. Correct. And you're Correct. code balancing yeah. that. Okay. But the core data services happen on the server side. Yeah. Right, no, but it, you know, yeah. when we start looking at cluster architectures, how you distribute distribute deal with the access ports Correct. is an, intri- an, an important architectural item. So I cheated and I clicked the button while you guys were talking, but basically... I was counting on it. <laughs> all that does is uh, just gets to this screen, which basically it does a discovery leveraging Avahi and ESX SLPD to discover all the other remaining ESX hosts in the environment that have our software running that haven't already been included in an existing cluster. And so we have about 12 nodes here. And so it's pretty straightforward. You simply select uh, which uh, nodes you'd like to configure. For example, if I just wanted to configure four of these. What, what's can, the IPMI used for? We have the ability on certain server models to actually change the IPMI. So let's say you started off with DHCP and your entire environment was running up on DHCP. We could uh, configure the IPMI to a static address if you like. If you leave it blank, we just don't touch it. Okay, so you're, you're not using IPMI no. to, to monitor up node up and... Absolutely not, okay. no, no. Fine. Yeah, that's why it's blank in this case. And then you can put... Uh, define your cluster uh, management IPs, vCenter information, et cetera. And basically at the end of this, we'd automatically register all the hosts within ESX, create data stores, et cetera. Um, but I'm really bad at typing. And so what I'm going to do is click here and go to import configuration. And I'm going to just drag over a pre-configured configuration file that has everything defined. Much easier. Which is much handier. And basically all I'm doing here is putting the serial number of each one of the nodes that I'm bringing on. You know, through ESX we have all that information, so we match the serial number, and then we IP everything based on that serial number information. And so here I've already got all this information, NTP, DNS, etc. You have the, the option of enab- enabling our auto support, which is basically uh, send us, sending us nightly emails of the status of the um, cluster, etc. Something you can easily enable or disable. So here I'm just going to type in the secret credentials to my vCenter. Those look familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to be five characters. And so this is just going to go through, validate network settings, make sure we can resolve DNS, etc. Apply the network settings and then eventually create the cluster. And this takes about 10 minutes or so. Uh, to complete on a typical cluster. And so I'm going to move over. You had a storage IP address associated with every uh, compute node, is that? That, yeah, that, that's basically. Separate? The, it's basically an IP address. So each controller VM has its own IP address, and that's the IP address that that's referring to. 
It's just the nodes that are providing storage. Yes, right. just the nodes that are providing storage. Got it. Yep. Right. So let me jump it over like to one -one the web client. To and so at the end of all of that, 10 minutes it. later, we now have four ESX hosts oh, added into our environment, um, fully operational. And so actually, let me. Uh, the vCenter web client at its finest. You want us to come back? <laughs> <laughs> I get this a lot when I demo this, but um, I heard it's better in, in uh, vSphere 6. With uh, they, um, They've made some improvements in Flash. But uh, here we're in the vCenter uh, web UI, and this is just your normal vCenter cluster view. Here you can see uh, we have four ESX hosts, total of 80 processors, memory, uh, et cetera. We've added a Spring Path portlet right in the cluster view, so you can get a quick overview of the capacity available in your cluster and how much you have free. There's a little link here, which will bring you back to uh, our, our plugin, which you can get more information, like uh, the dedupe information, usage information, um, et cetera, once it ever gets there. Uh, let's see. Normally, it's not this bad. That's why I have multiple. <laughs> I'll move over to another cluster. And so here you can see we have our usable capacity, used, free, provision, pretty much all the metrics you'd expect to see, monitoring, etc. cetera. Dedupe ratio? Dedupe ratio, yes. Ah, flash has crashed. Excellent. <laughs> oh, that's just shocking. <laughs> <laughs> Advertisement for VMware to finally switch to HTML5. <laughs> Should have uh, set the, the XGs. Uh, right. <laughs> you know, you, you would think I had three tabs open, all all three of them closed, but <laughs> <laughs> that's only one instance of Flash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so let me jump back to this cluster here. So again, you can see the dedupe compression savings, uh, etc. Get monitor monitoring information once that loads up and then view the general status. And so everything's tied within vCenter, and so if you have an error, so you pull a drive, you lose a node, any error or alarm gets propagated up to vCenter alarm. So it's nice if you're using any monitoring tool, like vCops or something, to monitor your vCenter cluster, you'd automatically get an alert. We actually ran into a problem at a customer. We hooked into their production vCenter, and as they were doing POC testing, it was their production vCenter, and it constantly generated alerts and- And freaked out their admins. And freaked out everybody. So something okay. we need to warn customers ahead of time. OK, and the, the performance data on the right side gets written to a log so I can analyze it later? It is configured in a database, and we don't, I mean, it is, there's a REST API to it. It's not user exposed today, but it's something that we could expose so that you could move, uh, export that data elsewhere. But yes, it is stored somewhere so you can get access to it. You feel a uh, uh, good use case for it, exposing all the performance data to outside? Yeah. yeah. Mm. Right. And here we also give you the ability to drill down on each individual node just to see the status and health of each disk in the cluster. Uh, this particular cluster is a four node UCS cluster. It has four C220 M4 servers. Each has eight disk slots in them. And so these are pretty beefy servers. We have it basically fully packed. In each slot, there's two SSDs and, and six HDDs per node. I'm going to jump over to interacting with the VMs. I know we have a few minutes left here, but if I jump over here, just, just to iterate on what Malik was talking about earlier, uh, one is our, our native cloning. And so when you right click on a VM, you'll see that there's a new Spring Path portlet that allows you to do snapshots. So I'll just go ahead and do a snap. Right, and if I just tell it to take a snapshot with the standard workflow, it's a log-based snapshot, and yes. you can't get rid of those till we have vVols because we need them for so we, we BSAPI DP. Well, actually, we've solved that before vVols is available, so, somewhat. I'll go into that real quick. So, oops, wrong vCenter. Center sandbox. And so you'll see that because we integrate directly within VMware, that snapshot I just took shows up right in the native snapshot manager here. Okay. It's not in a separate snapshot manager. That's and so VMware has marked this as a native snapshot. And so when I go into here and take another snapshot, again, we don't have a plugin for the thick client. This is just pure thick client here. Take a new snapshot. It's a native snapshot. It's That's just a native really snapshot? Yes. And a VSAPI DP uses native snapshots, or does it st that still use uh, any vStorage API for data protection? 
if so, the underlying VMDK is a native snapshot, the subsequent snapshots which are used for the VADP are also native also snapshots. Native snapshot. Right. Okay. You guys win the prize. And so that that that's the best native snapshot integration I've seen. Thank you. Thank you. And I yeah, looked at a lot of them. The uh, the great thing about this is we don't have to write hooks in for all these different backup solutions. Right. When they call, as long as you have the initial snapshot was created with our plugin, any subsequent snapshot will always be called using our API automatically. And, and so integration is just seamless. And and since your snapshots are very low cost, exactly, my workflow is going to be, dear administrator, as soon as you create a VM, create a snapshot so that we always use the native snapshots. Right. Exactly. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we made it a little easier for that administrator to do that if they're not, you know, big power CLI or API users is I can right click on this folder, go to Spring Path and take a snapshot. Like we mentioned earlier, take right. a snapshot across the entire folder. Oh. Or a resource group. Great. So I can so all the all the VMs I just created, I created today or in that folder, I create the first snapshot and then I redistribute them. Exactly. Correct. All right. And just one other thing. You guys have to stop doing things right. <laughs> <laughs> and just one other area of integration <laughs> I'd just like to show is even for our logging, we didn't want you to have to go to a separate place to get logs. And so if I go through our normal process of exporting logs. Basically, anytime you do a VM support bundle, it'll include our bundle. It's nothing too fancy, but you'll see um, the spring path. I won't go through it, but you'll see a new spring path manifest there. And uh, every time you grab logs, it'll include ours. And so lastly, actually, let me show the GUI first. <laughs> Another option we've added is this feature called ready clones. And really all it is is just a fancy word for massive cloning. And so, here you can choose the number of clones you'd like to have off that base image. You can give it a customization spec. One unique thing we've done with the customization spec is if your customization spec is set up so that you're giving out static IPs, what we'll do is, let me just give a name here. For example, if I were to name these VMs, we would automatically try to resolve the IP of these VMs via DNS. If we find the DNS entry for this VM, we'll automatically slipstream the IP into the customization spec so that when you power on these VMs, not only do they have all the other customizations, it also has that IP, so you don't have to go in and manually IP these VMs afterwards. That's another thing we've added. And of course, you can power them all on after it's done cloning. And just to illustrate uh, how quickly we can do this, I have a PowerShell CLI script that's gonna go out and let me get to the right vCenter here. That's gonna basically make 50 copies of this VM. And so in this folder, I have this golden image VM, and it's going out and creating 50 copies. It's going to next boot all these 50 VMs to simulate a bootstorm, and then wait for VMware tools to start up on all 50, and then time that. And so it takes about 30 seconds to do the initial cloning, probably another 30 seconds or so to power on the VMs, and then another 30 seconds to wait for VMware tools to start up. And so, obviously, for VDI use cases, this is, this is awesome. You can now create recompose pools extremely quickly. Uh, a lot of our customers who are in the dev test uh, environments are really loving this capability because now they can spin up and spin down VMs uh, very rapidly.